I'm Josh Young with uh, Bison and Trust. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, Going to go through a brief background of who I am, who Bison is, and then uh, walk through a microcap idea. Let's see if I can get this. Okay, uh, important disclaimer. Give a, a second. Um, and I guess just uh, this isn't an offer for the fund uh, or for uh, or a recommendation of any specific uh, security and your own due diligence. Um, so we're going to go through again uh, overview on Bison, talk about our investment philosophy and sort of how we figure out what to focus on and what to buy. Uh, brief on oil and gas uh, because the idea is an oil and gas company and uh, the specific idea. Um, so a little bit about me. I've uh, been doing. Uh, public equity investing for a while, uh, focused on oil and gas public equities for the last decade or so, um, which is why I look a lot older than uh, in that period. <laughs> and uh, I was chairman of the board of a public company uh, in the oil and gas space and sold it profitably at a time where not a lot of oil and gas company stocks were doing well. Um, there, there have been a few stocks that, that I've talked about publicly over the last couple of years that have done pretty well. Uh, talked about these on uh, TV or sort of uh, sort of very public formats, and this is important because we have, we have to get our, our registration changed for our fund, but can't sort of disclose performance. And I think it's important to sort of calibrate um, idea performance uh, in terms of understanding quality of research as well as understanding um, sort of I guess likelihood of a future hit rate. So 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 far stuff that we've shared publicly. Has has done pretty well relative to the index of publicly traded oil and gas companies. Um, so what we do is uh, try to find uh, there's there's a number of oil and gas publicly traded companies. I think it's sort of in a three to four hundred range now um, across uh, North America and other jurisdictions, upstream, midstream, um, and uh, we look for companies that are undervalued with uh, decent assets. Uh, that are, are cash flow generative, uh, great management teams, and where there's some uh, catalyst line that can help unlock the value. And then it's very important that the assets are able to support balance sheets under a variety of circumstances. Oil and gas is obviously extremely vol. And um, this idea we're going to talk about in a second has survived sort of the worst oil and gas downturn maybe in history with negative prices. Um, I think it's important to to the extent that one invests in this space to invest in companies that are survivable and where the people are there sort of adding value every day. Um, one of the things that we do that's pretty different from how a lot of people approach, uh, approach the space, in addition to sort of having an older school sort of valuation heavy focus, we're also looking at uh, idiosyncrasies in um, the oil and gas value chain that aren't well understood. So with the prolonged downturn, there was sort of an evisceration of the, uh, let's say, sell side experts and outside experts, as well as the buy side ability and sort of bench to evaluate the space. And so things that might seem either very esoteric or very obvious can often lead to very interesting public equity ideas that are able to outperform. I'll give a couple of examples, well, three examples. So you could tell in late 2020 that there were three different things changing, that in West Texas, natural gas prices had been heavily discounted, that in North Oklahoma, natural gas and natural gas liquids prices had been heavily discounted, and that in Western Canada, and this was in uh, a little later, it was in early 2021, that um, heavy oil in Canada was, was heavily discounted. It was possible through understanding that those situations, which had been the case for a number of years, had changed. It was possible to identify individual securities with exposure to those specific things that also met our other criteria that were able to do materially better than the average oil and gas company. And again, that's very relevant because in a, a that is as cyclical and is poorly understood, it really helps to have these sorts of factors that are very underappreciated, misunderstood. And, you know, it, it is a benefit from having focused on a space that's been hated and mostly left for dead for a very long time is being able to come in and sort of pick this sort of special situation, this sort of extra catalyst that allows material outperformance versus sort of the average oil and gas company. And 
uh, I think in all of these cases, the companies were micro caps at the time of the start for this chart. So uh, it's helpful. Also, I mean, at this point, I don't think any of them are. And so you know, obviously that helps to have multiple percent sort of returns on ideas to get them from small cap or micro cap up sort of that larger cap range. Um, very briefly on oil and gas, uh, there's a lot that people say about it. There's a lot of different things people are tracking. Uh, there is a big thing that's not on this chart, which is just that China right now is actually locked down for COVID and a presumption that would make it relevant to invest in anything in oil and gas would be a presumption that China would eventually sort of re That's, I think, uh, baseline. Uh, frankly, investing in almost anything related will also be tied to that, along with many other different sectors. Uh, with a specific outside of that sort of global macro question, um, inventories are still drawing kind of amazingly, even with China locked down. Uh, rounds are very low relative to the price of oil. Uh, oil and gas equities are a very small percentage of the overall market relative to uh, what they've over time, particularly where they've been at prices that are anywhere close to where they are now on an inflation adjusted basis. And then there's just not a lot of capital spend still relative to how much has been spent historically globally across upstream and and oil field services. And so you kind of need a lot more spend for a number of years in order to get back into an adequate applied market. So there's going to be a lot of demand-driven swings, but over time, and there is that significant step up in spend, um, it's likely that oil prices stay high. And again, you can just look through the history of oil and gas you really need this uh, top right chart, the global EMP spending. You need to see that spending up be higher than it was in 2014 on an inflation-adjusted basis, um, and get it there for at least a few years, potentially more, in order to get back into an adequately supplied buyer. So, uh, Journey Energy, uh, I own the stock, and again, please do your own due diligence. Um, it's producing a little over 14,000 barrels a day. Um, market cap is just over 300 million Canadian. It's got pro forma about 100 million of debt or it should exit at that uh, end of this year, uh, assuming roughly 80 to $85 oil, which is right around in price and the forward curve through the end of this year. Um, and so just really quickly, it's a very cheap stock. It has good asset economics. It's doing a roll-up, which is really interesting, and we'll get into more on, on that later. The CEO is great and has made people a lot of money before. And they have some hit assets that offer significant downside protection, along with an ability to um, essentially unlock material value over time. So um, we've talked about Journey before, and it's done really well, and it's done very, very well relative to its peers. And one of the things that I think is interest in the stock market is people hate stocks that have gone up a lot, and they hate stocks that have gone down a lot. And Often, um, and I guess they also hate stocks that are just flat and have done. And often, the things that we'll find that are most interesting have one of those sort of three share price patterns. And so, in this case, I think people look at the company and say, "Hey, well, the stock's up a lot, therefore I've missed the opportunity." When in fact, the valuation is very low. They're executing on an excellent plan, and you know, they're on back to, to potentially earn a very attractive return, even relative to how they've done so far. So one of the interesting things about it, again, in the context of the stock gone up as much as it did, is <laughs> their run rating, like close to two cash flow, they have enormous free cash flow, and they traded a large discount to the um, third party assessed value of their producing reserves, excluding value or inventory and undeveloped and the less likely reserves, the probable and possible in the reserve category. So it's pretty rare to find companies that are doing very well and are this heavily discounted. And my thesis is just people look at it, see the stock went up a lot, and I think they have trouble getting over that in order to buy it. And again, this is it's not, there isn't some sort of uh, story on, hey, there's some product that's going to sell really well and then, you know, may or may not continue to have traction. It's, they're selling oil and the oil macro uh, assessment is uh, 
is is doable and sort of independent of uh, of journeys and prospects. What what they're doing is is pretty simple. They're just taking assets that have a very low decline rate, and they're cash flowing them. They're reinvesting full amounts in order to grow slightly organically, and then they're taking the rest of the cash flow, paying off and buying assets at accretive prices and just doing it over and over and over. And, and that's very sort of boring from a management perspective. And it's not sort of the, the hot thing to do with resources stocks, which is to pay dividends or buy back stock. But it is a mechanism for generating well above industry average returns over, over the medium term, even uh, through sort of multiple uh, movements in, in both directions and commodity prices. So they have a lot of uh, upside from current oil and gas prices. And, you know, pick your price. This is, just, we pulled it from their corporate presentation. Um, you know, they're, they're estimating that Let's give him a few minutes or a few seconds to see if he comes back. Forty million next year in free cap. That's again relative to their performance debt they're getting. Um, if they were to do that over a let's say three year period, they could pay off all their debt and buy back all their stock. And then, um, you know, they could do that all over again or pay sort of very, very high dividends supported by their free cash flow. So very, very cheap. Um, I thought this was interesting. A friend uh, pulled this together, um, uh, fact checked. Uh, most of this is sort of directionally consistent. I wouldn't rely on individual transaction metric from this. But basically, Journey has been buying uh, assets over the last 18 months. And when you look at the valuations of their asset, just on a very sort of simplistic, high-level basis, they're paying on the low end of the going rate for assets at the times that they're buying. And as they do that, to the extent that they continue to be careful about the assets that they're buying, and again, this is just on one metric. I think they actually look better on other metrics. So this is um, price per barrel of oil produced per day. Um, the other metrics that I think make them look even better is they're buying production that has very low decline rates. So their reinvestment requires very low. And so I think that really helps in terms of the ability to generate a lot of free cash flow from it. But as you buy cheap assets and you just keep doing it over and over again, as long as you're buying them for a, a big discount relative to where your stock is trading, you're going to end up generating a lot of accretion. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, the last aspect is, is that they have this uh, power generation that they've been uh, ramping up. And here, sorry, one second. That they have the uh, power generation they've been ramping up. Um, power in Alberta is scarce because they've been shutting down coal power plants. Um, there's a wide spark spread. Journeys vertically integrating the power generation with their natural gas assets. They're rapid growing power generation and integrated power generators could arguably be worth, let's say, 10 times EBITDA versus their overall business trading at like we were to unchange EBITDA. So with that, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions if there's time for it and uh, maybe to be able to uh, drink a little more water. 